Sweet. A lot of spatial. Nice, yeah. It, when Inger um, talked about that problem earlier about you know merging the elevation map and everything, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. That sounds really hard. Uh, so I need to up my game. But um, yeah, so today I'll be talking uh, not on spatial visualization, but um, a different kind of visualization, which is um, related to some machine learning work that I've been doing. So let me try to start sharing screen here. Can everyone see? Okay, yes. sweet. And I can see the chat as well. So excellent, let me just. Okay. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about these two packages that I developed within the past um, two years or so. And the first is tree heater. And the second will be PMLVR. I know it's a mouthful, but I'm gonna try to explain that a little bit more um, on the second part of this talk. And um, yeah, so I guess let's get started. Um, what does tree heater do? Okay, so the tagline of this package is that your decision tree may be cool, but what if I tell you, you can make it hot. And um, the, re the, the way that we do that is to in in integrate a heat map at the end of your decision tree. So instead of having these um, regular leaf nodes that you see from a lot of different decision trees, um, now I'm gonna try to tell you that that can be replaced by a heat map and that's gonna improve the visualization quite a bit if your decision tree is a good decision tree. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay. So before we go any further, I want to kind of step back and see what tools we have right now in R to visualize the decision trees. So this is our part plot um, from the R part package. And um, just to back up real quick, uh, Decision trees are essentially, as you can see here, um, a machine learning a, a way to, a machine learning model really to um, give you a prediction on the label given these features. So right here we have a Titanic data set. Hopefully everyone's familiar with this data set, um, famous Kaggle data set. With um, for each, uh, we we have features such as. Um, in this case, sex or gender, um, classes, uh, I believe SIPs is number of siblings, age of the passenger, um, and we predict whether they die or survive during um, uh, the, uh, after the pandemic. So here, you know, if, if say you have a, a person, you come into your decision tree, if um, uh, they are male, then you go left, and then if you're gonna check if their age is small or large, and if they are, you know, essentially going to the end of the decision tree, and this is called leaf node or terminal node, and you have, you know, um, oh, for example, in this case, this node says that this person survived um, with, I believe, 89% chance. So that's something that is, um, what the decision tree gives you. Um, in this case, our part plot gives you, you know, these nodes with um, essentially like the purity of that node and uh, you know the, the the condition that's being met underneath the node and whether you go yes or no, uh, true or false. Yeah, you follow the the branches. Another package that you can use is this network. Um, in this case, you can use the this tree function to visualize your decision tree. So in this case, um, we have the iris data set with uh, species. Uh, and well, the species is the outcome of the data set. And you were trying to figure out if a flower with this uh, petal, with the width of this petal and with the length of this sepal and how what, what kind of iris that is. And so that also can go into a decision tree like this. Um, it's kind of cool, but I feel, um, you know, the, the squares are not that informative. And uh, yeah, I wasn't sure like what these numbers are and so on. So, um, but it, it does make a nice kind of network plot here. The next package we have is uh, from the party, is the party kit package. 
And uh, in here we have the plot party function, which I find really, really nice and really helpful. So we have here, um, I believe this is an education. Someone told me when I presented this at Our Ladies Philly, someone told me this is an education data set from Germany. So that was interesting. Um, there, I realized that there are some German words here. Um, but yeah, the education data set, as you can see, besides those information that we had earlier, we also have the p-values um, that essentially tells you how significant the feature is in predicting the outcome. Um, and again, you know, in these branches, you can see like larger than, smaller than, and so on. Um, one cool things that you can do with Block Party and Party Kit is that you can um, put an, uh, a histogram at the leaf node. Like in this case. Next, we have ggparty, which is really built based on um, party kit. And, uh, but as you can see, it's a lot more flexible at each of these nodes. You know, you don't have to have just one node or number or something anymore. You can actually put in like a histogram or density plot. Um, and then at the leaf node, you can do a lot with it. But in this case, um, they decided to plot the uh, do a scatter plot of, of the um, features and then the outcome. Um, I want to mention one Python package in case you're working with Python. I think Vtreeviz is a really nice library that you can use to, um, you know, it does, uh, it shows like a, a stack bar chart for uh, each of these nodes. And I think I find that really nice. Which I think this is also the Iris data set. Oh no, this is, sorry, this is a different data set. Um, but yeah, we have a stack bar chart and how each decision kind of split the distribution into different things. And then eventually, um, you know, at the leaf node we have here essentially pie charts, which I think is quite cool because it shows you how big these nodes are, but also how accurate um, the predictions are. So, you know, as you can see here, if you go to node 11, that a lot of that's going to be green and that's great, um, but there's still some inaccuracy in there. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, the, the slides are at um, slides.com slash shang1618. And it just, the, if, if you go there, it's just the first slide deck that you'll see. So, um, let me know if you need that be paste in the link in the chat. Okay, so going to tree heater, um, I know this is kind of a lot to look at right at the moment, but we still see that structure of a tree, right? We still go into the, um, each node of feature, we go to the left, that's one condition being satisfied. Uh, if you go to the right, that's the other condition being satisfied. And then you kind of go through these features, they can be repetitive, uh, but at the end, you get a prediction for each of these nodes. And um, as you can see here, besides the node names, which are, um, by the way, color coded uh, based on um, the actual species that are in there, uh, we also have, uh, uh, besides, besides the leaf nodes, we have a heat map that's attached to that leaf node. So. Um, does anyone recognize this data set yet? If you if you do, maybe put it in the chat. Yes. <laughs> See, um, it is it is the Peng penguins data set. Everyone beloved um, Parma penguins, and. Uh, so what is being shown here is, um, well, first of all, at the leaf node, for example, you can see here, this particular leaf node is quite small and it actually is not that accurate because you can see it's still a lot of chin strap penguins that are being gathered and, and being labeled based on the majority vote of this node, which is a deli. So chin strap penguins in this case is being um, predicted as a deli when they are not. Um, but you know, in most of these other nodes, you can see that, uh, okay, the, yeah, the, the accuracy is pretty high, like the Gen 2 penguins um, are all here and it's uh, all labeled as Gen 2, so that's good. Um, another thing that we can tell from this heat map is that 
Oh, and I should mention each of these thin columns is essentially one penguin. So, um, you know, all the penguin, all the Gen 2 penguins are being labeled here. And as you can see, for example, oh, Gen 2 penguins are maybe slightly bigger, right? Because they have larger flipper and larger uh, bill. Um, we can see also that, okay, most of all of them looks to live in the Biscoe Island. Um, so things like that are things that you can draw from um, a, a decision tree with a heat map attached to it. So um, I, I thought this was really cool to, you know, besides seeing the, the model itself, the decision tree itself, we can see the data that associated with that as well. Um, and obviously you can choose what to show and what to not show. So um, if you think that, um, you know, football length may not be that, important of a uh, feature, then you can remove that um, if you want. But yeah, I, I, I think this is a very nice way to kind of also do a self check on a model as well. Like if it says that that's Gen 2, does that really make sense? And does kind of um, the, 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 the feature separate, the, the feature, the, the values of the feature separate out like that. Um, and I, I think it's just cool to look at as well. Um, so yeah, so it's on CRAN and um, when I uh, give this talk to the Our Ladies Miami group, it was um, just like, it just got accepted, uh, the, the, the revision of it just got accepted. So that was, I was really excited um, to show the 0.2.1 version. Um, okay, so how do you use tree heater? Just very quick here. Um, Jawad, I'm going to get to your question in a little bit. Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so I'm going to use the word target to mean um, dependent variables or outcome. Oh, sorry, the one dependent variable or outcome or the you know phenotype if you're working with biomedical data. And the features are essentially the predictors of the variables that um, give you that, that target. So for example, in the penguin data set, the target would be the species. Um, different, uh, the three species of penguins. And um, the, the features would be, you know, like the flipper link, uh, the bill link, um, and so on, and the island that they live in. So with that terminology, um, the, the core function in tree heater is called heat tree. And um, essentially this function has a lot of arguments, but the one um, important argument that we're gonna focus on here is um, this X, which can be a party object or a constant a const party object, um, which you can use, um, which you can pre-compute it uh, based on like this this G or sorry this party kit package, or you could do also um, a party node, so you can actually you know draw your own decision tree and. Um, I'll show you that in a little bit. It's the code, the code is a little bit clunky because essentially you have to you know, show, okay, this node is the parent of this two node and this right node is the parent of the next two nodes and so on. So it's a little bit long, um, but you can do that if you wanna like, do your own manual tree or you can just give it a data frame. And what tree heater would do is it would automatically compute the conditional tree for you and um, all you need in that case is that um, a, a, it, you have to give it a um, uh, label for the target. So in this case, you know, outcome or species or something. Um, but yeah, it do that for you. Um, so I want to showcase another data set that um, decision tree. Uh, worked well on, and and um, I show you how tree heater kind of um, give a better idea of what the samples look like. So this is 351 blood samples from patients um, in Wuhan at the beginning of COVID, and um, in this case we have three features, um, essentially uh, lab values that that we were um, able to get and see if this patient die or survive from COVID. And so these three features are lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, lymphocyte levels, 
and high sensitivity C reactive protein or CRLP. And this is from um, a paper published uh, early last year. And so, sorry, I'm gonna try to minimize things so I can see. Okay, um, so in this particular function, uh, you can see that this X equals COVID, that's my data frame, essentially. And remember we have, you know, the outcome of uh, survive or die and the um, features of, uh, let's say, uh, LDH, CRP and lymphocytes. And then the target lab here is, uh, the, the target label is the outcome. That's how it's labeled in, in my COVID data, data frame here. And so this is what we get um, from tree heater we have uh, lymphocyte being the first node. And then, you know, you go to both sides. Um, if it's less than 12.7, um, and then if it's even smaller than 5.5, then the patient will likely die. If, if they're small, but their um, CRP is actually still small, then they're likely to survive, um, so on and so forth. So as you can see, it's, you know, uh, the, the, the decision tree works quite well in this case. And, uh, you know, the accuracy for each node looks really good. And also, you know, we can kind of associate, you know, the, the patient in this group um, seems to have very high LDH, high CRP and low lymphocyte and so on. Um, so yeah, so now back to the question, are these three uh, is for classification. Um, I would say most of the time you would use decision tree for, for classifications, but I show you that we can also um, in tree heater use this for uh, a regression problem as well. Um, but yeah, it's the classification is what I'm most familiar with. Um, what if you don't want to use, uh, what if you don't want to show features um, in your decision tree. So in that case, I, I would just be interested in simply the decision tree. I don't want any heat map associating with my decision tree. All you need to do is say feed sequel NA, and then um, that's essentially what it gives you. Again, I think it's still quite nice to have a decision tree like this, whether you know, you're teaching machine learning and you're trying to show your students uh, decision trees, or um, you're you know, uh, just kind of want to look at how accurate the um, decision trees are in terms of, um, you know, each nodes and how, how pure the node is um, and so on. So I, I, I think it, it's still quite valuable and it's, I would say, less complicated than, you know, a decision tree from, say, our part plot um, with like so many numbers and stuff. Uh, quick question, how has 12.7 obtained? Excellent question. So this I, I should have uh, go deeper into it, but uh, Tree Heater uses a party kit is the package that we use to compute the conditional trees. And so um, to really answer your question, I think we would have to like go through a machine learning class uh, for that. But essentially, you know, we, we have a training and a testing data set um, and you, you train the data on a train set, uh, figuring out, okay, if, you know, I, I move this, if I make a, a, a threshold, in this case, 12.7, um, what would my outcome be? And uh, so, yeah, so these numbers are determined based on um, some accuracy that is um, predicted using the features and the outcome. The, I, I'm trying to find a better way to answer that. But um, we, we can also talk afterward as well. Um, I do want to say, so that most of that work is being done using Party Kit, which is, again, an amazing package um, for this injury. And, uh, but my tree heater is more focusing on the visualization part of it. Um, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Um, yeah. It, 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 it's good, and we can definitely talk more about this later as well. Um, a lot of people to ask me right now, like, can can I use Tree Heater to visualize random forest? Um, and the, the answer to that is not. 
yet because um, I, I think, yeah, having to kind of aggregate many, many trees and, and visualize that is quite challenging. Um, so, yeah. Another way, when we, we, we talked about, you know, you can use um, tree heater to just draw a tree that you want to, um, to show. So in this case, you, you have even like, you know, with pencil and paper, you manually draw your tree, you man manually um, choose your bricks. Um, then you can um, put that, all of that in here. So for example, you, you define the split, it's happening. And then you define this node, this uh, node would be the parent of this one and which would be the parent of these two nodes and so on. And um, again, the syntax is a little bit clunky, but um, that's just the nature of trees. Um, but once you have that custom tree, you can put that into your X argument. Um, you give it a test data, you can, this is optional, but you can. And once you do that, it will also show you um, an accuracy. So in this case, you know, I just kind of define my own tree. This is, you know, say I, I know all of this without all the machine learning. Um, and I was able to draw this tree, then, um, you know, it, 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 it would do the same. It would draw the decision tree. You have a heat map at the end. And then um, it would also, if you provide data tests, it will also show you the accuracy, the balance accuracy, um, the kappa coefficient, um, ROC, PRC, and so on. Um, this is all computed using the yardstick um, package in the tidy model collection. Um, yeah, I think. That's essentially it. There's a very nice vignette, or is, I think very nice vignette, no, quite detailed vignette on um, how to use tree heater, um, different functions, um, different options that you can do. You can move things around, uh, space it out a little bit more if you want. Um, if you want to print a lot at the node, um, which at the default, I didn't want it to print everything, but if you want to, you know, you can, um, right in here, okay, I want label to have the no ID, I want the, the split bit value, and I want to see the p-value that associated with that feature as well. You can do all of that. Um, again, you know, you can ignore the features if you want, you can um, use only a few of the features. Um, someone mentioned earlier about classification versus regression, so let me, show you, you can, um, so this is the data set called Galaxy that we have um, in, in the tree heater package. And um, it is a regression uh, task because the outcome is continuous, but you can still do that. Um, so you can see that, you know, like most of the node in this, I'm trying to make it a bit bigger. The node in, um, the, this node, for example, its target has uh, generally higher value compared to other nodes. Um, so again, I, I don't know how informative that is, but if it's something that um, is useful to you and if your decision tree is something that you really want to show people, I think um, it, it's really nice to associate the data with it. One question in the chat uh, is, so this package is only for visualization of ML results. Um, Yes, and particularly for decision trees. Uh, if you have, yeah, so the, again, if you didn't do machine learning and you just kind of draw your own trees, let's say you're just trying to teach students about decision tree, you can do that, um, you know, but you can manually provide the node and, and um, show the tree um, with the data if you want. And, uh, yeah, uh, it also, as I said, computed um, the conditional tree for you if you did not pre-compute the tree. So um, I hope that answered your question. But um, okay, so yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. I think, um, you know, just play around with it, even if you just wanna show this to, um, again, a student of yours, or, you know, if you're writing your thesis and you want a nice figure that 
actually communicates what your trees were doing, then um, that's great. But if you don't have a decision tree, if you have more like a random forest or completely different machine learning model, SVM and whatnot, this is this is not the package for it. So, uh, but um, so that's on the visualization part. The second part now I'm going to talk about is um, the package P and LBR. Um, but before we get to that, um, can we, when, when we think about benchmarking, um, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Um, I give people a few seconds to write that in the chat. A standard, nice. Or even, yeah, any like kind of adjective that goes with it, um, verb. Yes, comparison, good. Testing versus training. Reference. Nice, yeah, so these are all very good answers. Um, The definition is essentially a standard practice to illustrate the strength and weaknesses of algorithms with regards to different problems characteristics. So exactly, we have, you know, we want some sort of um, comparison between um, some standard uh, data sets or, or standard methods, right? And, and to show, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of, of either the algorithms or, um, you know, whatever methods you, you have. Um, and strengths and weaknesses can be with respect to accuracy, with respect to speed and so on. So great, um, I'm glad that we all agree there. And uh, so PMLB stands for Pen Machine Learning Benchmark, which is um, essentially a suite of uh, data sets that is used to um, evaluate machine learning algorithms on. So, this effort actually started before I joined the lab at Penn, um, but when I got to it and we kind of revamped it a lot, um, make a nice uh, website for it with um, an additional R interface that you only have the Python interface. Um, and yeah, so I highly recommend you check it out. It um, again can be used for anything, well, obviously benchmarking your machine learning model. Um, so it has here, Let's see, um, 162 classification data sets and 255 regression data sets at the moment. Um, you can, oh, I meant to go there in a bit. Um, this is, if you recognize this is a Blotly chart, um, it has, you know, these data sets name and this the number of observations in that data set, the number of features in that data set. Um, red is classification, um, green is regression, so this is satellite image, and so on. So you can play around with it. Um, if you click on it, which I did earlier, it leads you to a, let me just go ahead and do that for example here, um, a pandas profiling page, which um, is kind of fun, and it shows you, you know, what, this is kind of like skim R, but to a different, a little bit more extensive than skim R, because um, it shows you like all these numbers, but also, um, you know, what the distribution looks like. Uh, this is called pandas profiling, um, a Python library. Um, yeah, and then you can go down here, you can see, okay, what if I want um, to see the interaction between two different variables, what happens? Um, what are the correlations between the features? I think it's really, really important that we look at our data, no matter what, you know, where it's from, or, you know, if you say we get a very good result at the end, um, I think it's so important to come back and look at the data to see if there's any um, thing, you know, irregular in the data. And uh, I think pandas profiling is a great way to do that. Um, let's just close this. Um, another thing is to 
And another thing you can you can browse another tool that you can use to browse these data sets is this table right here. Um, if you recognize this is a data table from R again, um, very nice tool. And you know when you can search for things, um, say I want to see the penguins data set. Um, it shows you again number of observations, number of features in there, how many classes. In this case, we know this three species of penguins in here, so we have three classes. Um, there's also, so again, if you click on the data set, it gives you, sorry, the pandas profiling of that. Um, you can do interaction between these variables. Um, one cool thing that I want to show and which we need help with is um, metadata. So if you click on the metadata, it leads you to a GitHub page. That is I hope everyone can see this. I'm not sure which what I'm sharing, but hopefully you're seeing a GitHub page um, with the data sets penguins and how um, uh, what the description of that is, the source that I get it from, um, and so on. So again, I think we should really focus on um, the metadata, which is you know where the data comes from, uh, and if there's any irregularity with it. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, there is sorry this Zoom tab. Uh, it's a little bit hard for me to click around. It keeps wanting me to go to. Okay, there we go. Um, so there's an R interface and um, it, it has its own GitHub page as well if you want to look at it or you can just go here and, and see um, how to essentially uh, use PMLBR and uh, the, the, the main function is very simple. It just fetch data. So you give it a data set um, name and uh, it will do, it will fetch that data set for you and you can take a look at, um, you know, the data frames and stuff. So an extremely easy way for you to say, um, oh, I just need a data set to do, you know, to show my new algorithm that, you know, but I don't want it to be too big, maybe only, you know, a thousand observations and a few features and they want to show that on my decision tree which is essentially why I came to this project in the first place because I was I needed something for tree heater um, and there's not really anything out there like with um, Kaggle for example you had to download the CVS and you know save the file somewhere and then make sure that you read it in with the path code correctly and everything um, so we're, the, the goal of this package was to you know First of all, have a good, high quality data uh, collection of data sets that you can use, and also making it easy for, for the users to, to get to the data set um, without you know, having to do any kind of downloads. Um, yeah, so I wanted to spend some time here um, talking about what we need from you if you would like to um, contribute to this. Uh, effort. Um, we try our best to make this process as easy as possible. Um, what do we need help with? We need help with, you know, if you have a really cool and nice data set with, you know, clearly defined features and outcome, we'd love to have that in PMLB. And so you can, you know, add new data sets. Um, and, uh, or you could also editing existing data set. So um, there are a lot of I show you the metadata file. There's, um, you know, descriptions and source and everything. We still need help with that. Existing data sets in PMLB, a lot of them, well, some of them has metadata, but some others, the metadata file is quite, uh, is essentially blank right now. So it would be really helpful if, you know, you've never done any open source contribution and you would like to contribute and, um, you know, just talk to me and, you know, I'll, Try, try my best to show you the way, but hopefully this is clear enough. All you need to do is, you know, kind of go in and, you know, make some edits and then issue a pull request. Um, 
but yeah, if if that workflow is a little bit um, challenging, just talk to me. I'm, you know, we're trying to create a very uh, welcoming environment so that contributors are, um, even though, you know, even if you're not that familiar with GitHub or that familiar with machine learning, you can still help out. Um, and a lot of these metadata had been added by undergraduate students. Um, so it's, it's helpful. Um, but yeah, we're trying to make this process, you know, uh, the, to, to streamline this process so that if you add a new data set, I, I won't have to ask you like, oh, update the summary stats or, you know, go and add anything. Everything would be automatic. So um, if you add a data set, um, I think a reviewer would come in and ask you, hey, can you add a metadata as well? And then everything is going to be um, automatically updated. So your data set would, you know, be in this chart and be in this table. Um, so yeah, I we would love more contribution and uh, talk to me if you have any questions regarding that. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, so we use the same, sorry, let's the, the now going back to the PMLVR part, uh, we use the same terminology here, you know, target to indicate independent, uh, sorry, target to indicate dependent variable and features to um, indicate predictors or variables. And all you need to do is use that fetch data function I mentioned, PMOVR. Um, it can be, you know, wine quality. We have a data set on red wine quality. So that's really fun to, to play around and see, oh, um, what are the features in here? So it has fixed acidity, volatile acidity. Um, there's some other, features in here as well. And then the target in this case would be um, the score of that wine. So is it a highly rated score, which is, I think from this, this is from theater to nine. So if it's highly rated or not very um, high quality. So we essentially trying to figure out what contributes to a good wine, right? Um, so I, let's see what time. So I, I know that it's been, maybe 45 minutes. Um, I don't know if we want to go through this together, but you're more than welcome to do so um, on tiny.cc slash PMLBR. If you do want to follow along and you know run all of this together, um, make sure to save a copy of the notebook in your own Google Drive so that you can start editing. Um, I don't, I don't really know if we have time. But yeah, yeah, okay, maybe we'll do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through a notebook for like 10 minutes and then um, I take questions. Let's see what I have here. Okay, sorry, I go back here. Um, any questions so far? Inga, you think we have time to maybe go over some code or? I'm always pro going over some code. <laughs> Sounds See. great. Okay. Awesome. We do have some time. I have a question on the, the tree heat R. Um, so most of the trees were showing um, the actual features that were used in the decision tree. Is there a way to show the features that are left out that may not be predictive of? Uh... Yes, yes. Um, perfect, really good question. And yes, there is a way. Um, so I showed you earlier, uh, I'll, I'll leave that on, but um, I, I believe the argument is called feats. And yes, the default is that it only shows you the important features that were used in the decision tree, but you could add other features um, that are in your, your own data frame as well. So um, yeah, so in that case, you would do feet equal, let's say, um, you know, besides the, um, I'm trying to think about the penguins data set, um, besides the football length and the bill length, maybe you can um, show like, the height is the height of the penguin one of the criteria I don't remember but yeah so so you can add um, essentially as a 
character vector to the feeds argument and, and then it will show all the features for you. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, great question, thank you. So um, I, I hope everyone got there. Um, Penny.cc slash PMLBR. Uh, again, it's a mouthful, but pen machine learning benchmark. <laughs> and then it's R because I, I wanted to make sure that the GitHub repo is, is different than the general GitHub repo. So, um, okay, so I guess let's head there. And if you didn't get this working on your computer, don't worry, it's, it's quite simple. It's not, um, uh, yeah, it's not that intensive. So, so you can you, know, you can just follow along here without having it on your own machine. But um, yeah, I hope I hope this font is good enough, big enough for for others. But um, yeah, so this is a Google Colab notebook that I uh, set for R. And so as you can see here, it's using our version of 4.1.1, um, which is a really cool thing to do. Like say you don't, you know, you have a different version on your machine and you want to like test a particular code out in the newest version of R, um, I would just open a Google Colab notebook because that's that's easy. And you don't, you know, you don't chance like breaking things on your own computer and, and um, break it. Um, so yeah, so the first thing I do is to install these packages. Both of them are on um, CRAN, so you can just simply install dot packages. It would download everything for you. You could do, now we just load in the library. I'm gonna go ahead and load in ggplot2 as well. And now um, we're gonna be focusing on PMLBR here. Um, but we can we can test out some of the uh, tree heat our package uh, the functions later as well. Um, but yeah, so do PMOBR. Um, I've had this issue since yesterday. I don't know if you can see, but um, it keeps when I do a help here, it keeps giving me this warning. So. If anyone knows how to deal with that, uh, it would be much appreciated. I think the help page is supposed to come up somewhere, but it's not doing that for me. So, so, so sorry, it's just a warning that I, I shouldn't dwell on this, but um, yeah, let's just ignore that for now. Usually it, uh, this help page would come up and it's actually nice because you can toggle between different help pages. Um, but for some reason it's not working right now. So just ignore that, that's okay. Let me zoom in back. Okay. So then um, here we can, because we already load in PMLBR, now all you need to do is do fetch data. Um, and I'm gonna call this red wine uh, data frame. And then we can see, um, we can stir that red wine to see some data, uh, uh, the, essentially the right the, the the features and and what are they associated with so most of these are numeric features we have fixed acidity volatile acidity as we've seen before citric acid but residual sugar and so on um, and you have a you have a target here again um, showing you know, uh, how good the wine is so yeah so it's as simple as that you can just get the data set like that and then um, if you want to visualize this heat tree, uh, this, this decision tree with the heat map of the red wine data frame is all you do is, you know, do heat tree, red wine. Um, there's some warnings here um, because I use this seriation technique that um, kind of reorder the samples a little bit, but um, that's okay. I, I know this is a lot. <laughs> um, and maybe decision tree is not the best model here to classify wine. And, um, but I, I wanted to show you this so that uh, you, you see it, like it can be quite a, a lot. And um, your decision tree 
really needs to be you know, good in terms of accuracy, in terms of defining um, which is good and which is bad. Like, you know, the example we had earlier with COVID or penguins, otherwise it's just, it's kind of a mess and maybe it's not super useful to, um, to visualize that. And maybe another machine learning model would work better. Um, so yeah, again, it's up to you um, for when you want to use the, um, the tree heater package. Um, but a few more functions here, so you can do a different data set here, that's E. coli, um, and this is a little bit easier to see. And again, if you don't know what is in the E. coli data set, you can go to the pandas profiling or um, the metadata that's associated with E. coli to see what, what the data set's about. Um, and okay, because this is, you know, PMO VR was really originated from the, the need to um, benchmark. And so we'll do some benchmarking in this case. I'll first look, um, oh, and this is another cool function that you can do in PMO VR as well. You can find the nearest data sets. And what that means is that it looks at um, your data set. Let's say, you know, you have a really um, good data set that, you know, perhaps simulated data set even um, that you've been working with and your model worked really well on that particular data set. And now you want to find kind of similar data sets, which means, you know, perhaps similar in um, uh, number of features, number of samples, number of classes in your data set. In, in that sense, um, in that space, then it will find the nearest data sets for you. Um, or you can do um, a nearest, or you can, you know, if you have your own data set, great. But if you don't have your own data set, um, you can just give it a string. Um, uh, 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 yeah, give the argument a string here and then it will find the data sets within the PMO VR that is uh, closest to that particular data set. So in this case, you know, we see that E. coli, schizo, which is probably related to schizophrenia, uh, bupa, which is um, a liver related data set, um, solar one. Are data sets that have like similar size and some, some other similar characteristic to penguins. Um, I'm not going to run that because it's just going to give me a warning. So, and again, you can like define different uh, dimensions, and by which I mean, you know, if say you just wanted similar number of features, then you can just do n features, and that would be good enough. Um, Oh, so, okay, so actually what we're doing now is defining our benchmark data sets to be the nearest data set to Bupa. Uh, so these are all the data sets, I want 10 of them. So these are the 10 data sets that I'm going to test my machine learning algorithms on. Um, and which one are we going to test? We're going to do SVM. So to do support vector machines, I'm going to load in this package called E1071. Takes a little bit to run. Um, I define my um, SVM function here. It's, it looks like a lot, but it's actually just essentially splitting the data set into training and testing. And then the two things that I'm gonna, and the two models essentially that I'm gonna test is um, an SVM model with linear kernel. In this case, I call it um, linear accuracy. <clears throat> I will get the, uh, accuracy from that and taking the mean. So we're we doing this multiple times, right? And then um, we're gonna do the same for radial um, kernel of SVM. So we, we have two models, uh, SVM linear kernel and SVM radial kernel. And now we're gonna test these two models on the benchmark, on the set of benchmark data sets that we were looking at. Um, so yeah, so I believe I ran that. It's all good and now, um, Oh, first, I, I want to test that my SVM on just one data set, uh, and so it would give you here linear accuracy, radio accuracy. But now, if I want to do that for all the benchmark data sets, as you can see, um, we utilize the L apply function here. Um, takes a little bit to run because we're doing it for um, multiple data sets, and 
Now it's done, so we have 17 seconds. Um, I used to do call R by here, but obviously you can use by and rows from deep by R if you want. And um, yeah, so it, this is essentially showing you the accuracy for each of, for the two models on each of these data sets. And uh, because I don't love tables, I love looking at charts. And uh, so you can plot that. And on the y-axis here, you have radial kernel, the accuracy from radial kernel model. And on the x-axis, we have the um, accuracy from the linear kernel model. And as you can see, this is the 45 degrees um, line. And uh, so for most of these data sets, linear ac linear kernel actually performs better in terms of accuracy compared to radio kernel SVM. Um, but yeah, I think that is all I have. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions now, I answer, but, um, and yeah, please contact me or, you know, just go to the GitHub page and submit an issue if um, you have any questions regarding, um, uh, contributing to PMLBR or to HDR for that matter. So thank you so much everyone for joining me. Thank you. Thanks so much for speaking. And all of this is very interesting. I especially like the reproducibility of the uh, P, I'm going to say it right, I hope PMLBR package. <laughs> Is <laughs> it like plumber? So he tried not to say plumber. <laughs> no, I know. I wanted to make it plumber, but then yeah, it it's already existed. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I like the reproducibility um, of that. If you're using it for papers and stuff, as you're saying, it's very mm. easy for re for researcher to actually reproduce it compared to something you've downloaded from a Kaggle mm. site or something like that yeah that's quite cool exactly yeah and I think yeah the streamline is important and that's why I you know I, I want to automate like when someone is submitting an issue someone is adding something you know, making a pull request to add something I want all of that to be automated as well because you know what if you know we forgot to update the readme or update the summary stats and now we have you know 256 data set instead of 255 data set like all of that is um it, it should be automatic. It can be automated. So, um, yeah. Um, thank, th thank you. I appreciate that comment. Does anyone else have any questions? You're welcome to unmute and ask. I saw a question just now. Um, Maria, you, you asked what did target or the outcome variable mean? Um, so target is, a, a, again, a little bit hard to kind of coalesce all of these different terminology, but um, so, so yeah, so we use, you know, target to mean the outcome variable or the dependent variable um, because it's, you know, depend, well, our theory is that it depends on these other independent, independent variables, right? So for example, um, in, in the, wine data set, um, the outcome would be the quality of the wine. And that quality of the wine depends on all of these other characteristics of the wine, including acidity and citric acid and so on. Um, and so, so that quality is called a target. I hope that answered your question. Great, thanks. I also, Maria, I also love the emojis that next to your name. That's excellent. <laughs> Frank, you, um, it was asked earlier, your, your heat map R doesn't do the tree analysis. It's a, it must already be a tree object from one of the other packages. Um, is there, uh, do you have a preference from all those packages that you showed in terms of which one you should use not visualization in terms of sort of the output that it gives in the, the model itself yeah so excellent question also uh, i really like party kit um it it produced and there's there's papers associated with it as well why 
you know, conditional tree is better um, in, in many cases compared to the traditional just decision tree. Um, there's some weightings that happen that um, essentially makes the tree more efficient. Um, and that's why I, in my tree heater package, chose to do conditional tree. But yeah, um, that, you know, um, again, if you come up with a nicer uh, algorithm for decision trees, you know, um, you can use tree heater on that as well. So you just you can just pull it in. Um, does it? You said it has to be a party object, uh -huh. or a manual tree, or a data frame. Um, so if it comes from, for example, the the R parts yeah. package. Yeah. Yeah. So so does you it, could use. Do you have to do could, some conversion? Yeah, you could use R part to get your tree, and then you can do S party, and it will okay. just convert that to. Party. Convert it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Great question. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, people ask about visualizing random forests a lot. And, you know, random forest itself, I, I think, is um, uh, a really cool and really nice algorithm. Um, but, yeah, it's just very hard to kind of um, uh, aggregate and coalesce all these streams to something that's um, visualizable. So. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I, 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 I like tree heater a lot, but again, like I know that it's not for everything. So, um, you know, if you want to show it to a, a friend or, you know, you're te teaching decision tree um, as part of your machine learning course um, and, and you just kind of want something, you know, off the shelf to get the decision tree and to show it to, to the students, then I think, um, tree heater is nice because it's just kind of straightforward and you don't have to adjust that much but um yeah for for some others maybe so I, I do want to mention this so that COVID example is actually quite cool because what they did was they use XGBoost to get um these features first so so they have a Larger, much larger data sets, still 300 and over 350 sample blood samples, but they have uh, many more features. And what they did was they used XGBoost to find these best features, which including LDH, CRP, and lymphocyte, and then they apply decision tree on it. So essentially, they use a very powerful algorithm at the beginning to get the features and then um, simplify their model by just applying a, you know, one decision tree at the end. Um, so I thought that was kind of neat as well. I have another question if yeah. no one's asking a question. Uh, you mentioned that you could uh, manipulate the tree, you know, where the nodes were so that it could sort of be visually a bit better. Is it possible to make it circular? Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a very, very large tree, if he's, I'm not throwing, <laughs> and then you can have a circular heat map. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Oh man, I haven't thought so about that. If you implement it, then I will use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Inger. That that is that's brilliant. Um, I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, the I it I, I think it's possible. Yeah, yeah. My, I, my I, one PhD student looking? has done it. Sorry, go go. Uh, yeah, she's, she's she's looking for contributors as well. So yeah, Inger. <laughs> call to action <laughs> that's right <laughs> sorry i interrupted you my one phd student is working with this very very large graph so she's working with the sf networks package and the i graph mm. package um mm. and they're so large that we we actually said um it would be nice to put it in a circle because then it could spread out you know my dog's also contributing <laughs> to the, to the meeting. <laughs> but yeah i think because i think that heat map will you know when it gets um, really large, obviously you get very, very small little bits. So if it's spread out around a circle, it could be a bit more visually uh, visible. Pleasing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, yeah. It's just when I was building this, it, you know, I had to like really kind of calculate different um, distances and like everything, how, how that would work with ggplot. Um, but yeah, I, I think like a polar cord type of function could be really um, 
yeah, I, I, I may explore that. <laughs> Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, certainly, my dog wants supper. So he knows it's five o'clock, so he's, <laughs> he's telling me. <laughs> Thank you, Trang, that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I'm um, sorry, can I ask one? Um, just a, a follow up on Inga's question regarding the, the sort of the object type. So you said that you can use sort of your R part or your party kit um, with a, a pre-trained uh, classification or decision tree model. But if you just simply put in the data set like you've shown in the example, um, in the background, what type of decision tree? So you mentioned that you went for the conditional decision tree. Mm -hmm. So is that in the background, do you call upon the party kit or the R pod, or do you have your own decision tree logic built in? Yeah, and in, in, um, in the background, it, uh, I do call the party kit conditional tree, C tree function. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I came late, but I just, oh, just yeah, <laughs> I, I feel terrible. And I, I yeah, I, I scheduled the meeting with the, yeah, so I missed the schedule just like that. But anyway, um, you mentioned about the C tree and then I don't know, I wasn't there for the, whether you use the traditional tree. So which one is more efficient um, in, uh, you know, in classifying, uh, you know, the, your data set? Uh, Unfortunately, I wasn't there at the beginning, so I could be, you know, asking a question that has been asked before. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, oh, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. I'm, I'm trying to pull up this conditional tree function, uh, the paper. Um, unfortunately, I forgot his last name. I, I believe the, the first author's name is Thornton or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, you take a look at that paper. Um, I'm not an expert in, I, I study machine learning, but I'm not an expert in um, decision trees. I, and I, you know, when I built Tree Heater, that was two years ago when I first read the paper and, and you know, I studied that then, but I honestly forgot uh, quite a bit. Um, but the, 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 the still knowledge that I remain from that is uh, uh, the conditional tree is generally more effective and, and um, less biased towards um, uh, features with, you know, um, a lot of or continuous features or features with like a lot of categories. Um, so as I understand it, in general, it's better. Um, but again, you know, depending on the cases, depending on your data set, depending on um, how good it is. I mean, a lot of times, you know, you and, and I've tried tree heater on many, many uh data sets again if there's too many samples for example it wouldn't really make sense right now unless i get the circular going um but uh yeah or you know if you have too many features maybe it doesn't make sense um or if your decision tree just sucks like if it's you know doesn't really um help this you know split the samples um into the appropriate group of nodes then maybe it's not um you know, maybe a better, a different model is better for, for that particular uh, data set or, or problem. Um, but yeah, I think in general, conditional trees um, are nice because it, I believe that, well, the package, the party kit package I use is also like compute really fast, so. Yeah, did I share my code? Uh, so the slides would have, uh, all the links to the code, um, but I can, I, I can definitely, let's see, reshare them here. Um, or yeah, we can maybe add some of these links in the meetup as well. See. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa, for your comment. Cool. Thanks again, Trang, and thanks everyone for uh, coming and joining us. Thank you so we much. We appreciate you as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Trang. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, hopefully we get you to speak with, with us again.
on, on, on something else you're working on? <laughs> 